an Indian, and thus we would say in the United States a Hindu, he doesn't present himself as affiliated with any kind of religious or philosophical organization. He comes on simply as Mr. Krishnamurti. And he doesn't present any gimmicks, any obvious techniques, because according to his view, all these special practices are hindrances. In other words, uh, supposing a group of people take up Zen Buddhism, before you know where you are, they have become a club, a special in-group, and they are the Zen people, and they're, they're going to sell this thing. They're going to say, you should try our Zen, you know. Uh, you may be a Christian scientist, you may be a Catholic, you may be a Seventh-day Adventist, you may be a Theosophist, and all these ways have something to be said for them. But the real thing is our Zen. And then, of course, they all start sitting in meditation posture, and they put up hanging scrolls and burn incense and have Buddhas and gongs and so on. And all that can be used as a sort of social or cultural one-upmanship. And this is a very serious obstacle. Now then, Krishnamurti comes on without any bells or robes. He uh, addresses his audience wearing grey flannel pants and a white open shirt. That's it. And he talks without any spiritual technicalities or even philosophical technicalities. Absolutely dispenses with them. All he really does is ask questions. And therefore, he seems to many people as a total debunker who has nothing positive to offer. His approach is invariably one of this. Uh, you propose the question. In other words, you asked him to come here. Why? What is it you're looking for? And you ask a question, for example, uh, because actually many of his original followers came out of a theosophical background. They perpetually asked a question like, is there such a thing as reincarnation? Will I, did I have a past life? Will I have a future life? And instead of either saying yes or no, he comes back with, why do you ask? <coughs> is there a God? Why do you ask? Go into it. Go into uh, the state of mind you have when you voice that question. Why are you voicing? Well, people will defend themselves for, for a long time when faced with that. They'll say, well, I'm curious. Or isn't it one's purpose in life to find out these things? He said, what makes you think it's your purpose in life? Did just someone tell you so and you believed it? Why do you think that's your purpose in life? You have to back off a little bit. Say, well, um, I suppose the real reason why I want to know whether there's going to be a future life is that I'm afraid of death. Why are you afraid of death? Well, I don't want to lose my continuity. Aha! So that's the reason, is it? You are clinging to yourself. Yeah. Well, he would say, how, how can you possibly understand God or anything uh, of a spiritual nature while you're clinging to yourself? Aren't these two activities mutually exclusive? If you want to know what truth is, you must be open to truth, whatever it is. But if you are, if you say only that truth will be acceptable to me, which supports my conception of my ego, then you're not open. And you say, yes, I see. But then you say, how can I be open? He says, why do you want to be? See, you're just doing the same old thing again. You ask me how to be unselfish. But what is your reason for, for wanting to be unselfish? You don't want to be unselfish at all. You want to find a new way of getting around it all. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, in, in this manner, uh, he absolutely exasperates people because he'll never agree with anything anybody says. If they formulate it and say, Mr. Krishnamurti, is that what you mean? He says, no, 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 look, uh, go into it again. <laughs> don't, don't, don't make a formulation, he says. Don't come to a conclusion. Don't want to have a resolution of this. Just be, if you can, open to, to what is, to what you actually feel now. Don't judge it. Don't say it should be, shouldn't be. What is it? Say, when you are in a state of grief, uh, what is grief? Don't, don't say a word. Don't try to pin it down. Don't give a definition. Just experience whatever you have labeled as grief. 
I often ask people when they say they're anxious or something, where are you anxious? And they say, all over. Oh, I say, come now. How do you know you're anxious? What symptoms are there going on in you that tell you you're anxious? And then they begin to notice things in their stomach and uh, headachey things or whatever it may be. And then they come to a more concrete apprehension of the state of affairs that they have labeled anxiety. And uh, in this way, which is really, is really, really very like Zen because it's frustrating, uh, people come to see there's absolutely nothing they can do at all to s stop being selfish. So they see after a while that trying to stop being selfish is the same thing as selfish. Trying to get rid of grief is grief. And so when you see that, there comes a point which we could best call giving up, surrender. William James pointed this out likewise in his study of the varieties of religious experience and the psychology of conversion. There's the point of absolute frustration followed by surrender. And then in that moment of surrender, when you see you just can't do anything about it, you suddenly have a quiet mind. There is no further effort, you see, to say the thinker and the thoughts are one. That's a formulation. The experiencer and the experience are one experiencing. You don't need to say that. Because that's not the point. The formulation of it is not the point. It is the actual experiencing itself that is the point. But you can't come to that while you are going over in your mind all this chatter about uh, I should accept my experience, I should not accept my experience, etc. As a matter of fact, when psychologists sometimes say you should accept yourself, a lot of people just don't, you know. They're always fighting with themselves, clubbing themselves, and uh, allegedly disciplining themselves. And then they get into tremendous clutch-ups inside, and the psychologist says, now come. You're human. You should accept yourself. You, you, you shouldn't feel guilty if you get angry. It's very natural to get angry. Accept yourself. So people try to accept themselves. But then they come across the fact that there are certain things they do not and cannot accept, and they have to accept the fact that they can't accept them. Accept that you don't accept. And then uh, that's the same bind as Buddha put people in when he said, in order not to suffer, you must get rid of desire. But then people find out that they desire to get rid of desire. So you see, that saying, accept yourself, is a gimmick. And the, uh, it's an upaya. And the object of it is to bring you to the state where you see that the self which does the accepting is the one you need to accept. And in this state where you're confronted with the necessity of um, licking your own tongue, you suddenly see that what you thought was to be accepted and what was to do the accepting are all one.